Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back, I hope, for another episode of Mondays with Monday. That's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation at the Union League of Philadelphia. The other morning, I was having a banana for breakfast, and in my adulpated brain, that kind of ticked something off. And I thought, oh, the flying banana. And I'd forgotten all about it. And then I'd even forgotten that it was a Union League member who was responsible for making it. And so let's go learn more about the flying banana. All right. So I'm going to do my usual share screen. And here we go. Bringing the PowerPoint up. Come on. Let's go. Come on. I need you to get out of the way so I can hit. Come on. There we go. Took long enough from the beginning. And so we're back to our third episode of I Didn't Know That. There's going to be a lot of them, by the way, because there's so many things that our league members are involved with that are fascinating things. But in this case, we're talking about a flying banana. So let's see. All right. So here we go. Oh, my God. Oh, did that thing really fly? It did. And so let's find out all about it. And our story begins with this young man right here. You can see his name is Frank Nicholas Pius Secchi. He was born in 1919, October 24th, um, in Philadelphia. And as you can see, he died in Haverford, his house there, in 2008. So Mr. Pius Secchi is responsible for the flying banana and some other really fascinating aircraft we're going to learn about, hopefully rather quickly, because this could really go deep in the weeds. So uh, Frank Pius Secchi, um, as a young man, was very interested in auto gyros, which later became helicopters. And even as a student at Overbrook High School, he was studying, learning, working in auto gyro places and things like that. So when he graduated from Overbrook, he went into the town school of engineering at University of Pennsylvania and studied mechanical engineering. But he realized that mechanical engineering wasn't his, his passion. It was really aeronautical engineering. So he left Penn and went to the Guggenheim um, School of Aeronautics at NYU. And it was there he graduated in 1914. Yeah. I say 1914, I meant 1940. He wasn't even born in 1914. So he graduates in 1940. He goes back to Philadelphia, and he first works for a company called Platt Lepage Aeronautic Company. And Wynn Lawrence Lepage would later become a member of the league, but that's a different, did you know that, sometime in the future. Uh, he left them a little while later and went to work for Bud Manufacturing Company as an, in their aircraft division as an aerodynamicist. So he's really going now towards designing, if you will. And then it was in 1943 that he, with a former classmate at Penn named um, uh, Howard Benzie, they created PV Engineering Forum. And that would lead to this. And there's our hero of the story himself flying what was only the second manned helicopter flight in America. And this is April the 11th of 1943. Now, that's not the actual flight itself. Um, it, it it didn't mean to fly, actually, believe it or not. Uh, Piasecki at that point had only been in an airplane for a few hours as a pilot, uh, didn't even have a pilot's license. And the, the PV-2 that you see here was actually tethered to a rope, but the rope broke, <laughs> and up he goes. And so, uh, but Piasecki, over the cold cucumber, brought the, brought the aircraft down to the ground, and that was it. And now keep in mind, this is 1943. World War II was going on. And what the U.S. Navy has learned is that when it started the war, it was over battleships, but it's going to end the war as a war of aircraft carriers. Technology was changing that much. So battleships are pretty much obsolete. Aircraft carriers are in. Uh, but you know, aircraft don't always make it back to the carrier itself. And so the Navy is always looking for new, ways, new technologies to find ways to rescue pilots, for instance. And so that led to Hayasaki's creation of another aircraft. But let's take a look at this one. Okay, there it is again. And again, he's at the controls. And I love the way he's always dressed in coat, tie, wore a bow tie, by the way. Another reason why I like him. And his hat. Always had a Hamburg on. And, uh, and this is the actual craft itself in the Smithsonian Institution. Okay? Pretty neat stuff. All right. So Paisaki now is working with the U.S. Navy. And he's going to develop the first aircraft, helicopter aircraft, specifically for the Navy itself. And this is what it looked like. Okay? All right. It was called the HRP-1. And it does kind of resemble banana, doesn't it? Okay. So this is the world's first tandem rotor aircraft. That is two 
10 guns independently running, right? Uh, obviously, the, the blades aren't hitting, which is why the shape of it aerodynamically was such that the rear blades are higher than the fore blades. All right, and you can see it's, uh, it looks like it's riveted, so it's pretty basic stuff. And Pai Seki, by the way, was the first one to, he designed it and he piloted it for the, for the first flight ever, the test flight. And like, this might just be that test flight. And this is what um, a later version would look like. All right. So, and here we go. The Coast Guard had their own, but they painted them yellow. Hence, the flying banana. You gotta love it, right? Okay. So, obviously, this is a model, not the real thing. So, so um, it's 19, geez, what's going on? So, World War II ends, 1946. TV Engineering Forum is dissolved, and in its place is Hayaseki Helicopter Company. And you can see there's the PB2 on the left, and there's the HRP on the right. And this is Hayaseki Helicopter Company at their plant, and they were in Morton, PA, all right, south of Philadelphia. Okay. I'm sure Frank is in there somewhere in the very center. Yes, you say there's a guy with a tie on that's got to be him. All right. So here we are. It's now Piaseki Helicopter Corporation, and these are the initial investors in it. And there's Frank himself, chairman of the board and president. All right. But now keep on Piaseki. He's he's not wired for corporate management. I mean, he's I mean, this man's meant to be a designer, an aeronauticist, if you will. And and so he would have a bumpy road as the chairman and, and president. Um, and here he is. So this is the way he wanted to be. This is this is the Frank Pisek that he wanted himself to be. So there he is on the left-hand side in his, pilot, in his pilot leathers, all right? And on the right-hand side, he calls this his red baron look, okay? I mean, he was a serious pilot and, and designer, you know, right? He wasn't a boardroom guy. So what would happen eventually is that, oh, um, is that now at this point, Pisek helicopter is designing more helicopters for the Navy. So the, the flying banana, the HRP was known as uh, the rescuer because that was its mission. It was to rescue downed pilots in, you know, in the ocean when they couldn't make it back to an aircraft carrier. Uh, but as technology got better and materials got better, then he designed something called uh, the HUP-1 and 2. And so this is an HUP-1, right? And this one was called uh, the retriever. And this is what it did. So here, actually, these are actually rescuers. These are the HRP ones on the flight deck of a carrier. And I'm not sure which class that is, but you can see how big they are relative to the uh, the, the carrier deck itself. And this is an HU. This is actually an HUP rescuing a pilot whose plane had ditched in the ocean. All right, and that's what they were meant to do, and they worked incredibly well. All right. Uh, so not only the Navy but the Marine Corps the Air Force, um, the Army, and of course, the Coast Guard were all ordering these helicopters from Piasecki. And Piasecki is now becoming one of the, you know, the major helicopter manufacturer in the country, uh, along with Sikorsky. Because after all, it was Igor Sikorsky who a few years earlier then, Piasecki flew the first manned helicopter flight in America. But anyway, I digress. Not surprising, is it? So here's, here, so here's Piasecki at his office. As you can see, this is what he wants to do. He wants to design. I mean, that's what he, again, that's what he's wired for. It's in the DNA. And so in the left foreground, you can see the HUP-1, but behind it, there's a new model, and that's going to be called the HP-16. Let's take a look at it. And there you go. Or the H-16, rather, my mistake. Uh, because everybody wanted a bigger helicopter that could lift things, could carry things, right? Um, and so if you look at the right-hand side of the image, you can see that the, there's a ramp that would come down from the back of the helicopter, and it would be either a troop carrier to carry tanks, to carry, uh, you know, mobile um, mash units. I mean, whatever it was that needed to be carried, that's what this helicopter was designed to carry. And it was, at this point in time, the world's largest helicopter, okay, designed by Frank Piasecki and made right here in suburban Philadelphia, okay? And this is what it looked like in actuality compared to the HUP in the foreground. So look how much bigger it is. An extraordinary aircraft. Okay, and of course, that technology would lead to more technologies and better helicopter development as the years would go on. And so, obviously, it would lead to the Sky King, right? And which is now obviously more compact but jet powered, and it would also lead to the Chinook, right? And especially during the Vietnam War, the Sky King and the Chinook were were the workhorses of, of the Army, or the, the Navy and the, and the Army respectively. But as I mentioned earlier, um, 
you know, Piasecki was not really meant for the boardroom. He, it just wasn't his, he was most comfortable. And so in 1955, uh, Piasecki left Piasecki Helicopter and he would form Piasecki Aircraft Corporation. And there it is. Okay, that was really hard to find an image from. Sorry about it, it's, it's so blurry. All right, and it is now based, it's still around, based in Essington, Pennsylvania. All right, so anyway. So what is Piasecki going to do now? And by the way, um, right, so that was 1955. In 1960, Piasecki helicopter was sold to Boeing, aircraft division, and it would become known as Vertol, and then it became Boeing Vertol, right, which all makes sense, and Boeing Vertol is still there today. And we know that uh, Boeing Vertol took a lot of Piasecki's designs and incorporated them in the future designs, such as the Sky King and the, and the Jones, but also some rotocraft, as they were called. And, and think of the Osprey that we have today. And so uh, Frank Piasecki is considered the father of the rotocraft in terms of helicopter engineering and aeronautical development. So in the meantime, what is Piasecki Aircraft going to do? You know, they're, they're going to keep designing. That's what Frank Piasecki does. So this is a compound helicopter because it's both a, a single rotary shaft at the top, but it's also got, as you can see, again, look at that fan in the back, all right? That's got a, a jet attached to it, all right? So that was called the Pathfinder. And it was being developed for both the Army and the Navy. And here's the Pathfinder two, all right? Uh, obviously, we, you know, um, in a museum, uh, just nice and sleek and aerodynamic, all that good stuff. And of course, the Pathfinder two would lead to even further models. Now, this was being developed in the mid-1960s, 64, 65, 66, in the neck of the woods, all right? And this is called the Speedhawk, and this was developed by Piasecki in 2007. And again, you know, a rotorcraft and jet. And man, that's an interesting looking machine, isn't it? Okay, and think of, think of the aerodynamics of that. So that was, that's what Piasecki was doing. And Piasecki is still around, as I mentioned, to this day. All right, so what's going to happen next? Ah, there's Frank Piasecki. Now, what about Piasecki the man? All right, so um, obviously he became incredibly successful, world famous for his helicopter designs, but he also had a family life. So in 1958, he married Vivian O'Gara Weyerhaeuser. Yes, she's one of those Weyerhaeusers, all right? And they would eventually have seven children. They would have five boys and two girls. And to this day, Fred Piasecki is the chairman of the board of Piasecki Aircraft, and his brother John is the president and CE. Uh, they, have a, they had a younger sister, Nicole, who went to work for Boeing. Not surprising since it was in their backyard, basically, right? Although she went to Yale for <laughs> not bad to learn our aeronautical engineering, and she ended up with Boeing. Uh, she spent 25 years at Boeing uh, in all sorts of jobs, but eventually uh, was in charge of their propulsion systems uh, division when she retired in 2017. And as I mentioned, after 25 years, so high seconds, are, you know, they're all wired for, for this kind of stuff. Um, so Frank Piasecki, all right, he joined the Union League in February of 1982, uh, and he would, in 1986, receive uh, the National Medal of Technology, which was the highest award given in that field or category uh, in the country, and that is there you see Mr. President Ronald Reagan on the right, with Frank Piasecki on the left. And as you can imagine, this was one of many, 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 many awards that Piasecki received. Um, for instance, you know, I, I mean, it would take half an hour to read them all. There were that many of them. Uh, by the time he died, he had 17 patents to himself, uh, all those awards, numerous honorary degrees, um, and the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. So what a fascinating life and what a fascinating story for, you know, uh, a local guy done good, right, up there. And this is, this is the, I think this is a great photograph. I just, I had to put it in here. Because that, to me, that, that's just, you can see the man right there all in all his glory. So. So that is Frank Piasecki, Frank Nicholas Piasecki, 1919-2008, uh, died at his home in Haverford, Pennsylvania, and um, remember the Emily. Uh, and by the way, he's buried at Calvary Cemetery in Coach Hawking. Fascinating great story. Go out and take a look at it. Okay. So we hope you found that fun. I actually did that faster than I thought I would. <laughs> so I hope it wasn't too boring with too much information because there's tons more I could have talked about. So, uh, and, uh, and the next time around, you know, like I say, we're, we're going to keep doing these Did You Know That? Uh, Forever and ever, I think, because there's just so many good stories out there about league members and, and what they achieved and accomplished, so and how they affected the world in a very positive way. So, so stay tuned. All right. Thank you for watching. As always, I really do appreciate it. Uh, 
stay warm, stay safe, stay healthy, because it looks like it's going to get pretty nice out there this winter. So, so just be well, because we want you to come back and watch. So thanks to the Legacy Foundation, uh, the Legacy the Legacy Foundation, for sponsoring these videos. Um, hope you enjoy them. All right, see you next week. Thanks for watching. Bye.